Did anybody waken up this morning with cups of tea being brought to them in bed? No. Did anybody receive any cards this morning? Oh, Bill was... Yeah, okay. Did anyone receive any cards this morning? No. Oh, a few. Did any gifts? Yeah, I, I did too. Because, of course, today, if you haven't realised, is Father's Day. Now, Father's Day is one of those funny days, isn't it? It'll mean very different things to different people. So, for some of us, Father's Day will mean being pampered or spending time with people who are close to us. But for some of us, Bill's laughing... But for some of us, Father's Day will be a reminder of people who are no longer with us or for pe of people who are a long way away. For some of us, Father's Day will bring back happy memories, but for some of us, it will bring back difficult or challenging memories. For some of us, Father's Day will be a time for being grateful for what we have. For some of us, Father's Day will be a reminder of what might have been. So bearing in mind that it will mean very different things to all of us. Let's be kind to each other as we try to rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. So today let's trust ourselves and each other to God as we meet in the presence of God who shares our joys, welcomes our praise, knows our needs hears our cries, feels our pain, and heals our wounds. So our faith is built on the knowledge that God is our perfect Father, which is a great thing to remember on Father's Day, isn't it? God who loves us so much that he came to meet us in Jesus, who the Bible calls the Word the living, walking, breathing message of God come to meet us. Let's sing about that together.
also, Lord, as we meet together with our hope in you, we pray that we won't just meet with each other, important as that is, but we pray that we will meet also with you, to be encouraged by you, changed by you, challenged by you, so that we might be better followers, more like Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please do grab a seat. So just a few notices to tell you about. You may, the first one, you may have noticed that last week or the week before, there was a misprint in the notices email. Did anybody spot it? What was it? The date. Yes, there was a non-existent date in the notices. It said something about Thursday, the 1st of July, which does not exist. It should have said Friday, the 1st of July. So in here, on Friday, the 1st of July, at 10 o'clock, which you will notice is not a Sunday morning, we are having a communion service for years 3, 4, 5 and 6 from the school here. That's so that they can experience what a communion service is like, rather than just hear about what it's like in an RE lesson. It will be an actual communion and it would be fantastic to have a bit of a crowd of you here if you're able to join us. I realise Friday 10 o'clock is not the best time for all of you but if you are able to join us it would be brilliant to have you. Do just let me know if you're planning to come so that we make sure we put out enough chairs but it would be great to see you. Uh, and while we're talking about notices emails um, I know some of them have been going missing a bit, technical glitches that aren't your technical glitches at all. If you are not getting the notices and you used to do have a word with me because we'd like to work out exactly what's going on. Um, some people we've managed to get it working again for them so if they've vanished for you let me know and if you think there's a better way we could be communicating with you all every week do let me know too because we're open to other ideas. That's the notices I'm aware of. Are there any other notices that we should be talking about? Speak now or forever hold your peace. You're holding your peace, which is great. Now, children and young people, we're going to put the adults to the test and see if they are as smart as they keep telling us they are. Are you up for that? Yeah, so children and young people around the room, you will find 14 hidden letters. Go and find them quick and bring them out here. And we need 14 different people to be holding the 14 different letters. Very good, you spotted one there. If you've got more than one letter, you might need to find a friendly looking adult to hold it for you, because we will need to have you all holding different letters. How are we doing? How are we doing? You've got three. Wow. Um, keep going. See what else we can find. Oh, I can see at least one more. Alf can see at least one more. Excellent. Keep hold of those for a minute, Arthur. Right, how many have we got? Let's count them up. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Brilliant. We have fourteen letters. So uh, hold up one of your letters and could we have some volunteers to come and hold other letters because this is really not going to work unless we have 14 different letters thank you very much who would like to come and hold another letter brilliant thanks Roz excellent Taylor you grab a letter who's got a spare letter brilliant so now if you all turn round uh, now we need one more oh we need to, someone else to hold one of these eyes, like otherwise, unless you can separate your arms. You probably don't want to separate your arms, do we? Excellent, Bill, thank you. And then if someone could take one of these from Andrew, that would be great. Someone want to come and grab a letter? Peter, you look like you're a spare part there. That's brilliant. So the challenge is adults who think you're smart all the time. These letters spell two different words. Can you work out what the letters, what the words are? It looks a bit of a jumble at the moment, doesn't it? You might have spotted some of the letters are green and some of them are blue. That's a clue. So let's just turn it that way. Yeah, that's it. So maybe all the greens go to one end. See if that helps. Obey. Obey is the green word. Excellent. So if, if the green words could go up to that end and green letters. Do you want to go up there? Arthur, go up there. 
and they'll help you get in the right order there. So all these other letters, what does that spell? What have we got? We've got an R, a T, an E, two A's, an X, lots of points in Scrabble, a P, uh, an S, and two, three E's. Any ideas? <laughs> How are we doing? <laughs> it's not extra something, no. Expert, ex, no. But it does start X. EX starts exasperate. Are we being exasperating? So let's shift yourselves around into exasperate. So X, Edward. Do you want to come here? X, S. We need an S. Who's an S? S, P. Who's the P? P. Arthur, do you want to go and stand in there? Uh, Exasp. Uh, okay. Peter, do you want to be the other E? Yeah, so stand between Arthur and Bill. Exasperate. Excellent. So we've got obey and exasperate. What does exasperate mean? Ask my brain. <laughs> Ask Peter. <laughs> what does exasperate mean? Annoy, Annoy irritate, frustrate. Yeah, okay, so these two words are linked together by a Bible verse which is very apt for today. Let's see the Bible verse that's very apt for today, Simon. That's the one. It says, children, obey your parents. Fathers, do not exasperate, annoy, frustrate, wind up your children. Instead... Bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So children, obey your parents. Do what your parents tell you. Now, of course, we know that sometimes adults get it wrong, don't they? So this is not saying that we should do what our parents tell us if they're telling us to do something that is very silly, which I'm sure happens from time to time. But it is saying... That our, when, they, when they get it right, our parents love us and have the very best for us at heart. So we should do what they say because they want the very best for us. But it also says fathers, which could also be parents or maybe adults, don't exasperate, don't annoy, frustrate, wind up the children in your care. But instead... Bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, does anybody reading that verse think that they've got anything to say sorry for this morning? Do any of us think that we have ever not done what our parents told us to do, even though our parents had our very best interests at heart and were right? I know I need to say sorry for that. Anybody else need to say sorry for not doing what their parents told them? Okay, good. What about the other one? Do any of us adults realise that sometimes we've wound up children, we've annoyed them, we've frustrated them, we've exasperated them? Yeah, I know I've done that, yeah. Um, and, and maybe, deliberately, that's even worse. Uh, and... <laughs> And maybe that next bit as well. Have we always done the job we should have done of training and instructing the children in our care in following Jesus? I know I'd need to put my hand up there and say, I've not always done that as well as I might have done. So, do you want to take your letters and go back and sit down where you were? Because as we think about times when we might not have done those things quite as well as we should have done, when we haven't obeyed the people who've got our best interests at heart, or when we have exasperated or annoyed or frustrated or wound up children in our care, or haven't done as good job in bringing them up to know Jesus as we might have done, we have an opportunity to say sorry to God and an opportunity to ask God to work in us so that we get better at it next time. Shall we click on to those words?
These might chime in with things that you want to pray as well. Our part, perfect Father in heaven, we are sorry that we have not always been the children or the parents or the adults that we should have been. For when we have chosen not to obey the people who love us and know what is best for us, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. For when we have exasperated the people in our care and annoyed them rather than helped them grow as followers of Jesus, Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. For when we have failed to copy the love you show us as our perfect Father, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And as we think not only of how we are sorry, but of how we want to change, to turn back, to do better in following in God's ways, we pray, may the Father forgive us by the death of his Son and strengthen us to live in the power of his Spirit all our days. Amen. We're going to sing a song which reminds us that even if we've not been perfect children, even if we are not perfect adults or parents, God is still the best ever example we could have as our Father. And that makes a massive difference to who we are as we are adopted into God's family. Let's celebrate that together. Excellent. Please do grab a seat and it's that time in our service where it's an opportunity for our children and young people to head out to their groups. So we've got a group going that way for years uh, four, three, four, five and six. We've got a group going through that door if you're up to year two and our secondary age young people are going for a bit of a wander with Christopher over to join the St Andrews young people at the church hall. Have a fantastic time in your groups. And as you head off, Sue is going to come and bring us our reading. Thank you, Sue. (laughs) 
Mark chapter 5, verses 21 to 34. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him. While he was by the lake, one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came here, came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with them. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch part of his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone from him. He turned round in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the truth. <coughs> he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Thank you, Sue. You can imagine the scene. A fishing village built a couple of hundred years ago for a couple of hundred people and their boats and their dogs. But now these days it's not so much about fishing. You can hear the seagulls, you can smell that smell of fish, maybe slightly rotting fish that you always do in these fishing villages. But it's not so much about fishing now, it's as much about tourism. And there's an ice cream van parked along the seafront and a, a shop selling postcards. But word has spread around the whole area that a major celebrity has arrived in this fishing village today. And word spreads fast these days, doesn't it? It's been all over Facebook and Instagram. People have been texting each other. They've been calling each other. They've been WhatsApping, saying, you'll never guess who I've just seen in the fishing village. And before long, the roads into the village are getting close to gridlock. People have parked their cars wherever they could find a space, even if it wasn't really a space. The grass verges are jammed with cars before too long, and the gap down the road is getting narrower and narrower, which is making the chaos even worse as cars edge their way between the wing mirrors trying to get into the village. And then when people have parked, they get out of their cars, they walk into the centre of the village, and they find that is packed with people too. Far more people are in the village streets today than they were ever designed to take. So people are squeezing in the narrow spaces between all of the houses, trying to catch a glimpse of this celebrity. There's a crush of people trying to get to the front of the crowd to see what is happening, to hear what's going on, and to be part of the action. And for those people who do get to the front of the crowd, for, near enough the front to see what's going on, there's a bit of a surprise. Because they can see someone they all know who is talking to that celebrity. The person they can see is a pillar of their local community. He's a hard-working local businessman. All of them have bought something from him at some point or another. And he's one of those well-respected volunteers who's on every committee in the village. He would have been on the Platinum Jubilee uh, organising committee for the street party. And he's almost single-handedly kept the village church going for years. 
He's one of those people that's right in the centre of village life. He's Mr Respectability, he's reliable, he's trustworthy, he's cool, calm and collected, he's unflappable. And so here is the surprise. Because this cool, calm, collected, unflappable Mr Respectability is on his knees in front of this celebrity. His perfectly ironed suit trousers are getting covered in mud and he is pleading with this celebrity. He's saying, my little girl is ill. We don't think she's going to survive. Please, just come and see her. You could make her better. This respectable man, who's the heart and soul of the village, was so desperate for help that some of the people of the village felt embarrassed to see him making himself so publicly vulnerable. Well, the celebrity, his name was Jesus, of course, he went with this man. And everyone else followed, as best as they could, in the crowd to see what was going to happen next. And right there, in the middle of the crowd, was somebody that nobody had really noticed. Because everyone's attention was on this businessman that Jesus was going to help. This person that nobody noticed, she'd had the odds stacked against her for as long as anyone could remember. She was one of those people who just somehow got overlooked. For a start, she was a woman, and in that village, that meant life was harder anyway. Women had less rights, less opportunities, less visibility. But this woman had more challenges than most because she'd been ill for 12 years and everybody knew about it because it was one of those illnesses that everyone was a little bit embarrassed about. They kind of felt maybe she'd done something wrong to make herself ill. So she'd become one of those people that everyone looked past. One of those people who, if you saw her in the street, you kind of looked through her as if she almost wasn't there. And this woman, she was desperate for something to change. She knew she would probably always be an outsider. She'd got used to that idea. But she just wanted not to be ill anymore. She'd tried everything. She'd seen all the doctors. She'd tried all the alternative therapies. She'd scoured the internet for every wonder cure. And she'd spent all her money and some more trying to get better. And none of it had worked. In fact, some of it had probably made things worse. But she'd heard about this celebrity. He was different. He seemed to be able to do things that only God could do. And she was sure that this Jesus would be able to help her. But she was so used to being overlooked, to being ignored and written off by other people, that she started to believe the lie herself. She'd started to believe the lie that she didn't deserve to be helped. She'd believed the lie that this businessman that Jesus was going to help was more important than she was. She'd believed the lie that Jesus wouldn't be interested in her. So somehow, in this crowd, the woman managed to squeeze her way to the front of the crowd without anybody noticing. She was sure if she could just reach out and touch the corner of Jesus' clothes, she would be made better again, without bothering anyone. Nobody would notice that she'd done it. She thought she could get away with it. So she stretched out her hand through the crowd and managed with the tips of her fingers to touch the edge of Jesus's coat. And instantly, she felt something inside her change. She knew that the illness had vanished. She knew that she wasn't gonna have to waste any more of her money on cures that promised everything but delivered nothing. Even though she would probably always be overlooked and written off by her village, at least she knew that she was better. And that was good enough for her. It would mean that the pain and the suffering had come to an end, even if she was still an outsider. She could quietly get on with her life, being ignored by everybody else. 
But then, it felt like this whole new world she was about to glimpse was collapsing around her before it had even started, because Jesus stopped in his tracks. And he turned round and he said, who touched me? There would be confusion in some of the news reports later about exactly how that had happened. Some people got the impression that Jesus had been angry, as if the question was more like an accusation than a question. But anyone who was there and actually heard what Jesus said, they heard his tone of voice. And there could be no question. He wasn't angry. He was full of love and compassion, as if he knew the answer to the question before he'd asked it. Who touched me, he asked, as if he didn't want that moment of encounter with this hidden woman to be lost as an overlooked and forgotten moment. As it, it was as if he wanted to give his full attention to this person who dared to silently ask him for help. It was as if he wanted to notice the person who nobody else had noticed, the person who had secretly had faith in him. It was as if he didn't believe the lie that this woman wasn't important enough to help. Well, Jesus' disciples, they thought he'd just become a bit oversensitive to the situation. They said, look at all the people crowding around you. Somebody probably just touched you by accident. And that local businessman, his name was Jairus, by the way, he was so desperate for Jesus' help, he wanted to hurry Jesus on to get him to his house before it was too late for his daughter. But in the middle of that crowd, even when everyone else was hurrying Jesus on, he just stopped. And he waited to properly see and properly meet this woman who didn't think she deserved to be met. This woman who at that moment was the most important person in the world to Jesus. Well, after a minute, the woman owned up, trembling. She was probably terrified of being blamed for passing her uncleanness onto this important man of God and making him unclean as well. Perhaps she thought she was going to get into trouble with Jesus for bothering him on his way to more important work with more important people. But if she did think that, she'd misheard Jesus' tone of voice when he asked his question. Because his question was not an accusation. His question was an invitation. Whoever touched me, come and meet me properly. When it was out in the open who had touched Jesus, when the whole crowd who had for the first time noticed the woman who they had overlooked and written off and forgotten for so long, Jesus said to her something that he didn't ever say to anyone else in the world. Or if he did, nobody wrote it down for us to remember it. Jesus said this to her. He said, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Daughter. Jesus never said that to anyone else. But he said it to this woman who thought she wasn't worth helping. He said it to this woman who thought that she was less important than the businessman. She said this, shed it to this woman who thought she didn't deserve to take up any of Jesus' time. But she became the only person Jesus ever called his daughter. And that one word turned her physical healing into something much bigger. Because it told everyone that this woman who had been excluded from village and church life for 12 years because of her illness wasn't just healed, 
It told everyone that she had been welcomed back into God's family by the man of God himself, Jesus. With that one word, Jesus reversed the shame that she had felt so long. Jesus undid her invisibility. And Jesus showed everyone that she was important enough for him to go out of his way to help. With that one word, daughter, Jesus undid the lie. He undid the lie that she, or anyone else who felt like her, didn't deserve his attention. Jesus undid the lie that she, or anyone else who felt like her, wasn't important enough. Of course, that story I've just told isn't quite the same as the story of the events of Mark chapter 5. Facebook, Instagram, cars, suit trousers, none of those appear in Mark for very good and very obvious reasons. But the experiences of the people and the impact of the events in Mark chapter 5 are, I think, absolutely identical to the ones in the story I told. So why did I retell the story of the events of Mark? Because Mark already did a pretty good job of telling those stories, that event, those events, didn't he? Why did I retell those events as if they happened in a British seaside village last week? Very simply, because I think it's important to remember that we are not very different from the people in those original events 2,000 years ago. We might not be very different from the crowds of people trying to see what was going on with Jesus. We might not be very different from that respectable businessman and volunteer synagogue leader, Jairus. And we might not be very different from the woman who didn't think she deserved to be helped. The woman who didn't want to distract Jesus from more important work with more important people. The woman who didn't want to bother Jesus. Why do I think we might not be very different from her? Because I hear it most weeks. Most weeks I hear people saying, don't worry about me, I'll be okay. Most weeks I hear people saying, I didn't want to ask anyone to pray because I didn't want to bother them. Most weeks I hear, I'm sure you've got much more important things to be doing. And that reminds me of this woman who met Jesus. This woman who felt like she had to get help from Jesus without anybody else noticing. This woman who felt like she didn't want to bother anyone including Jesus. So she just tried secretly on her own to cope and then to reach out and touch Jesus without anybody else noticing. But that's not what we as a church are about, is it? Or at least not what we should be about. Of course, we are not Jesus ourselves. We are not God on earth. We have our limitations, limitations of time and resources and skills. We cannot fix each other. Of course, it's Jesus that we need to come to for help. But we don't need to do that secretly, like the woman reaching out to touch Jesus, not wanting to bother anyone else. Us and our walk with Jesus does not need to be a secret, private thing. We all need God's help every day, with the big stuff as well as the small stuff. It's not a sign of weakness to admit that to each other. We don't need to wait for a disaster or a crisis before we ask each other to pray for us. Asking for prayer is not bothering people. It is not a sign of weakness or failure. It's a completely normal part of life as a Christian. So if we ever feel that we don't deserve Jesus' help, remember that is a lie. It's a lie which Jesus undid when he turned round to meet this woman who didn't think she deserved Jesus' help. And remember, if you need Jesus' help with something, big or small, you don't need to feel like you need to keep that to yourself. 
You don't feel like you need to secretly reach out and try and touch Jesus without bothering anyone else. In fact, let's flip that on its head. It should be such a normal thing that we need each other's prayers that I'm sure all of us have something we could ask people to pray for us in the next week ahead. I wonder if we could ask people to pray for us in the week ahead, week ahead. Not because it's going to be a crisis week, but because we shouldn't need to wait for a crisis before we ask each other to pray. Don't worry, I'm not going to put you on the stop spot and ask you to turn around now and tell each other the things that you would like to be prayed for this week. But here is a mini challenge. Asking each other for prayer should be so normal. Could you start your conversations over coffee today with this very simple question? What can I pray for you this week? It doesn't have to be a confession that life is terrible. It's just an, a recognition that we all need God's help all the time. What can I pray for you this week? And if you're feeling really brave, why not even pray for each other before you leave the building today? Well, you'll be glad to know I'm going to shut up and not bring up any other mini challenges. But let's bring our focus back to Jesus. We're not about fixing each other. That's not what we do as a church. We're about coming to Jesus together because we all need Jesus's help and there is no one like Jesus. Let's use this next song to remind ourselves and focus on that Jesus who is like no one else.
There's no one like Jesus. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? We believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please do take a seat as Tricia comes to lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Lord God Almighty, you are the creator God who made this beautiful universe. Your hands flung stars into space and formed mountains and valleys, yet you still care about each one of us individually and you reach out to us in love. We thank you and praise you. Lord, forgive us for the times when we forget this. Forgive us for going our own way, for trying to cope in our own strength, for ignoring the love that you want to show us. Help us to turn to you, to be open to the Holy Spirit within us and to accept the help and love that you want to give us. And help us to turn to each other to ask for prayer. Help us to be a caring community, ready to bring each other to you. We come to you now with our needs and fears, thinking of ourselves and those we know. We lift before you any illnesses, stresses about work or home, financial worries, caring responsibilities. Thank you that you care about all these things even more than we do, and you have them in your hands. We pray for healing and for your Holy Spirit to work in power to cut through these worries. Help us to trust in you and teach us if there are ways in which we need to change in order to serve you better. We lift our world up to you, Lord. We pray for all those areas where there is war. We pray for leaders who will bring reconciliation and peace. We pray for all those areas where there is a lack of food and resources. We pray for leaders who will bring about fairness and justice. Please be with us in our daily lives. Help us to turn to you for help. Give us the power and patience to face difficulties and give us the love and strength to bring your kingdom to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Tricia. Our final song, looking at the words, I think could well be the kinds of words that that woman in Mark 5 might have said and might have sung if she'd known the tune. It wasn't written at the time. But maybe as well as words that she could have said and sung, maybe they're words that reflect our experience too. When I was lost, you came and rescued me. Let's sing together.
Whether we're like the people in that crowd who are straining to see what was going on with Jesus, whether we're like Jairus who's quite happy to be seen to ask Jesus for help, whether we're like that woman who was only just beginning to dare to be seen with Jesus asking for his help. A prayer for us as we go into our weeks ahead. To a troubled world, may we bring the peace of God our Father. To a searching world, May we bring the love of God our Father to a waiting world. May we bring the hope of God our Father. And may we all know the touch of Jesus, the love of God the Father, and the power of the Spirit in the weeks ahead that we have. Amen. Please do stick around for coffee and don't forget that mini challenge. What can I pray for you this week?